-hmm. Okay, I think it's time to start the meeting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's joint seminar of the Department of Acoustics and the Committee on Acoustics of the Polish Academy of Sciences. I warmly welcome our guest, an outstanding scientist, Professor of Auditory Perception, Brian Moore, from the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation. Thank you for giving us a lecture today. I would like also to welcome the Dean of our faculty and the head of the Department of Acoustics, Professor Roman Gołębiewski, and the chairman of the Committee on Acoustics of the Polish Academy of Sciences, Professor, Professor Grażyna Grzelowska, and also I will warmly welcome uh, senior professors participating in our meeting, especially Professor Antoni Śliwiński. Welcome, dear professor. Uh, I welcome all of you conducting research in various areas of acoustics in the country and abroad. So, for some of us, the scientific achievements of Professor Brian Moore are well known. However, I would like to cite a few sentences from the biography of Professor Brian Moore. Brian Moore is Emeritus Professor of Auditory Perception in the University of Cambridge. His research covers both basic and applied aspects of normal and impaired hearing, including hearing, a design and fitting. He is a fellow of the Royal Society, the Academy of Medical Sciences, the Acoustical Society of America, the British Society of Audiology, and the Audio Engineering Society, and an honorary fellow of the Belgian Society of Audiology and of the British Society of Hearing Aid Audiologists. He is president of the Association of Independent Hearing Healthcare Professionals in the UK. He has written or edited 20 books and over 710 scientific papers and book chapters. He has been awarded the Literal Prize and the Literal Lecture of the British Society of Audiology, the Silver and Gold Medals of the Acoustical Society of America, the first international award in hearing from the American Academy of Audiology, the award of merit from the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, the Hugh Nose Prize for Distinguished Achievement from Northwestern University, and the Honorary Doctorate from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. We are very proud of this fact. He is wine steward of Wollstone College in Cambridge. So, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're welcome to ask questions, but after the presentation, during the discussion time. So before we start, I would like to add that the seminar is being recorded and Professor Brian Moore has agreed to the recording. His lecture will be available on at the, our uh, department website. So, dear Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andre, for that kind introduction. So let me first give you an outline of what I want to cover in this talk. Um, first, I want to describe the anatomy and physiology of the auditory system. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the types and prevalence of hearing loss, how common hearing is, and the nature of hearing loss. Um, and then I'll talk about the perceptual consequences of hearing loss, how damage to the auditory system changes the way that sounds are perceived. Um, and then I'll talk about what hearing aids can and cannot do to compensate for the perceptual deficits associated with hearing loss. And I'll, finally, I'll talk about some problems with current hearing aids and possible ways to improve them. 
So first, um, my presentation seems to have hung up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> so here's here's an, a, a diagram of the structure of the peripheral part of the auditory system. So uh, sounds enter the ear, travel down the ear canal, cause the eardrum. And those vibrations are transmitted through these small bones, the malleus, the incus and the stapes uh, in this area that's called the middle ear. And those vibrations are transmitted into this coiled up structure, which is called the cochlea. And that's where the sound vibrations are initially analyzed. And then signals about those vibrations are transmitted uh, via the auditory nerve to the brain. <clears throat> so, and here's a, an, an, <coughs> excuse me, an animation of the operation of the outer and middle ear. So incoming sound is causing the eardrum to vibrate. Those vibrations transmitted through these bones and that sets up a pattern of vibration in the inner ear or the cochlea. And these, these coiled structures here are to do with the sense of balance, but this snail-like structure here is the cochlea, which is concerned with hearing. Uh, now, hearing loss can be divided into two main types. One type is a conductive hearing loss, and that's where sound is not transmitted effectively to the cochlea in the inner ear. Uh, and conductive hearing loss can be caused by wax in the ear canal uh, or by problems with the bones in the middle ear. Uh, and sometimes those bones become fused together and they no longer vibrate flexibly or by fluid in the middle ear, which can be a result of infection. And that's very common in children to get infections that lead to a buildup of fluid in the middle ear and cause a conductive hearing loss. And usually conductive hearing loss can be treated medically. If it's an infection, antibiotics can help, or um, often if there's fluid in the middle ear, uh, a small opening is made in the eardrum and a, a grommet is inserted and that lets air into the cavity and uh, the bacteria that cause this infection can't survive when there's a, a free flow of oxygen. Um, or surgery can be done to fix problems with the bones of the middle ear. So while this is fairly common, it's treated, treatable medically. The other type of hearing loss is what's called sensory neural hearing loss. And this is caused by some malfunction or problem in the cochlea or the auditory nerve. And usually this cannot be treated medically. In the great majority of cases, there is no treatment for sensory neural hearing loss. And this is by far the most common cause of hearing loss, uh, particularly among adults. Now, I want to just say a bit about how we quantify hearing loss. And this is done via something called the audiogram. And what you do is to measure the threshold for detecting pure tones uh, at several discrete frequencies. Usually these frequencies are 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, and 8 kilohertz. Um, now here is what a, a, a pattern of, of the threshold of hearing would look like plotted as a function of frequency when you express the threshold at, as the sound level at the eardrum in dBSPL. Um, uh, but here, those same thresholds are transformed to a measure that's commonly used in audiology, and this is called the audiogram, where thresholds are plotted relative to the normal threshold, the threshold for young adults with no known hearing problems. And those are give a reference level of zero dB, and everything is, is expressed relative to that. So here we have an imaginary case of a person who has a, a hearing loss of 50 decibels at all frequencies. And that means that at each frequency, their 
threshold for detecting sound is 50 dB higher than you would typically measure for a young person with normal hearing. Of course, in practice, hearing loss nearly always varies with frequency. And in the most common case, hearing loss is greater at high frequencies than at low frequencies. Now, it's known that hearing worsens with increasing age. And I'm going to give you some numbers here for the UK population, but very similar things apply to most uh, uh, of Europe and the USA. Um, uh, not so, it's even worse in developing countries, but these are numbers that are typical of developed economies. So for the population as a whole, aged from 18 to 80, um, uh, about 16% of the population has some degree of hearing loss. And that's defined in, in this example as a threshold of 25 dB or more higher than normal, 25 dB hearing level or HL, averaged over the frequencies 0.512 and 4 kilohertz. So it's quite a high proportion of the population as a whole has some degree of hearing loss. And as you get older, that proportion increases. So for the, the age group 61 to 70, 30% 30 of the population, 37% of the population have uh, some degree of hearing loss. Uh, and for the age group 71 to 80, 60% 60 of the population have hearing loss. So it's very common among older people. And hearing loss associated with aging is usually greater at high frequencies than at low frequencies. And almost all people over 70 years old have a hearing loss at high frequencies. You have to really look very hard to find older people with completely normal hearing at high frequencies. Uh, but even when the audiogram remains normal, age adversely affects auditory perception. Our hearing becomes worse, our ability to discriminate sounds becomes worse, even when the audiogram remains normal. Now, we can ask the question, is hearing loss an inevitable consequence of aging? Is it just a consequence of getting older? And the answer is probably not. Studies of some remote tribes in uh, Africa and in the Amazon of people who are not exposed to noise or pollutants show that many older people have good hearing, a higher proportion, proportion than, in, than in developed countries. So hearing loss is partly caused by things that we're doing to ourselves. And many factors can contribute to hearing loss. Noise exposure is one. Uh, but there's large individual variability in the susceptibility to damage caused by noise. And people who've been in, in military service still very often suffer from noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, then there can be infections that affect the ear. Um, then autotoxic drugs. Uh, many antibiotics poison the ear, and many of the drugs used for chemotherapy also poison the ear and, and damage the ear. Solvents, particularly organic solvents, uh, as used in paints and in many factories to produce plastics and polystyrene and so on, uh, th these can adversely affect uh, hearing. Uh, smoking is a risk factor for hearing. Uh, and then, of course, there are some genetic disorders that, that lead to hearing loss. And some of those are, are so-called non-syndromic. So the only effect of these genetic factors is the hearing loss itself. And then sometimes there are autoimmune diseases that affect the, the auditory system. So there's a wide range of factors that can contribute to hearing loss and may lead to different underlying patterns of hearing loss. OK, this shows a cross section of the cochlea, a schematic cross section, and it's a curled up structure that's like a tube, um, but it's divided along its length uh, by a partition here. And running along the length of the cochlea is a membrane called the basilar membrane. Uh, and you can that's illustrated just here. And here's a uh, a cross section of a human cochlea, an electron micrograph. Um, so it's divided into 
these different chambers. This is just a cross section of the tube. Uh, and here <coughs> is the basilar membrane, <coughs> which vibrates up, up and down in response to sound that reaches the ear. And that's caused by a pressure difference across these two chambers called the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. But sounds lead to pressure variations across these two uh, partitions in the cochlea, and that causes vibrations on the basilar membrane. And lying on top of the basilar membrane is a specialized structure that contains cells that respond to these vibrations. And we'll look at those in more detail in a moment. So as I said, the basilar membrane is like a ribbon that runs along the length of the cochlea. And at one end, it's stiff uh, and narrow, and that end is called the base of the cochlea. Uh, and at the other end, the basilar membrane is much more flexible. It moves more easily and it's wider. And these changes in physical properties give rise to tuning. So the base of the cochlea is tuned to high frequencies and the apex is tuned to low frequencies. And there's a continuous variation in between. And this passive tuning that's caused by these variations in physical properties is enhanced by a biological active mechanism. So this is a mechanism that depends on specialized cells in the cochlea, which enhance the vibration in response to sound. So here is now a cross section of the cochlea homing in on a, a region called the organ of corti. The basilar membrane is shown here. Uh, it, it's running uh, in perpendicular to, to my screen and it vibrates up and down in response to sound. And lying on top of the basilar membrane are these specialized cells. And there's a single row of inner hair cells that run along the length of the cochlea. And these are responsible for detecting the sound. When the basilar membrane moves up and down, this whole structure moves up and down with it. And that causes a bending of these stereocilia at the top of the hair cells and th these look a bit like hairs which is why these are called hair cells and the bending of the stereocilia leads to a flow of electric current through the hair cell a release of neurotransmitter and stimulation of the neurons that go to make up the auditory nerve so the inner hair cells are like the microphones of the cochlea that are detecting the vibrations via movement of their stereocilia uh, on the other side of the organ of corti, we have we can see three outer hair cells, which again run in rows along the length of the cochlea. Uh, and the tips of the stereocilia seem to be embedded in this structure lying above that's called the tectorial membrane. But again, when the basilar membrane moves up and down, these stereocilia are bent sideways. And that also leads to a flow of electric current through the outer hair cell. But in response, they change their length and they actually feed back energy into the vibration of the basilar membrane. So the outer hair cells are like miniature amplifiers that increase the vibration on the basilar membrane, especially in response to weak sounds. And I want to show you a a movie next that illustrates um, how in a normal ear different sound frequencies excite different places uh, along the cochlea. So at this end is the base, the, the other tip is the apex, the low frequencies excite the apex, high frequencies excite the base. And this is a simulation of the response of the cochlea um, to, uh, to complex sounds in a normal ear. And for the purpose of this demonstration, the unwound to make the cochlea like a straight tube. The coiling doesn't seem to have much of a, an effect on the function of the cochlea. It just enables it to be packed into a small space. And this uh, demonstration was produced by James Hudspeth at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute.
here we are with a view of the cochlea. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. Okay, so that's what happens in a normal ear. Each of the frequency components in that complex sound leads to vibration at a specific place along the basilar membrane and gives rise to a sharp peak in the vibration at that point. Now I want to talk about what happens when you have a hearing loss. Now sensory neural hearing loss is often associated with damage to the specialized cells in the cochlea, the inner and outer hair cells that I just talked about. But it can also be caused by a loss of the synapses between the inner hair cells and the neurons. And without the synapses, no information is transmitted from the hair cells to the neurons. Uh, and there can also be degeneration of neurons in the auditory nerve itself. There may be metabolic problems that uh, affect the biochemical processes inside the cochlea. Uh, uh, so all, though, all of those can lead to quite complex patterns of hearing loss. But here's a top view of, of the organ of corti in this example taken from the mouse. So this is looking down on the hair cells. And here you can see the stereocilia of the, the single row of inner hair cells and the stereocilia of the three rows of outer hair cells. So this is what you see in a normal ear. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the dimensions, this to the same scale, this is a single human hair. So although these are called hair cells, they're extremely tiny, they're extremely small um, compared to the dimensions of a human hair. Now, the outer hair cells, as I said, play an essential role in this active mechanism in the cochlea. And this has three functions. It increases the amount of vibration on the basilar membrane in response to weak sounds, but it also sharpens up the tuning on the basilar membrane. And it leads to a nonlinearity in the cochlea. There is a compressive input output function. So weak sounds, soft sounds are amplified a lot, but intense sounds are not amplified at all. And that means that a small, a large range of input sound levels is compressed to a small range of vibrations on the basilar membrane. This is a, a demonstration that I've taken from Jonathan Ashmore at University College London that illustrates the motor action of a single outer hair cell. So this outer hair cell has been extracted uh, from a cochlea. This is the, the part where the stereocilia would, would normally be. You can't see them in this preparation. Uh, and here is a micro pipette that's used to inject an electric current through the hair cell. And you'll see that in response to this electric current, the outer hair cell actually changes its length. So this is illustrating its action as a miniature motor. OK, and you could see that the, the, mainly the movement occurring at the tip here. Normally, things go the other way around. The current flows through in, in this direction when the stereocilia are bent, and that causes motion at this end, which uh, amplifies the basilar membrane vibration. And these vib uh, this motor activity can occur at very high frequencies, up to the highest frequencies 
that we can hear of 20 kilohertz or so. OK, so this illustrates the effect of the active mechanism. This is now looking sideways on at the uh, basilar membrane. This is a simulation of what you would see looking sideways on. This is a response to a fairly low frequency sound. You see a wave that travels along the basilar membrane from the base to the apex. It builds up and then it dies away. Um, but without the outer hair cells, the tuning is quite broad. Uh, and with the operation of the outer hair cells, uh, the tuning becomes sharper and the amplitude of vibration becomes bigger around the tip. Notice that the vibration away from the tip is similar in the two cases. The outer hair cells are selectively amplifying the response around the tip of the vibration pattern. Uh, here's an example of an ear with a uh, uh, from a mouse with a moderate outer hair cell pathology caused by noise exposure. And you can see that many of the outer hair cells have missing stereocilia. And here's a case of a more extreme noise exposure, and that has resulted in the, the, the degeneration of nearly all the outer hair cells. There's just a few surviving ones here. So what Changes in the perception of sound occur as a consequence of reduced outer hair cell function. Well, first of all, uh, low level sounds need to be more intense than normal to be heard. So uh, the threshold for detecting sound increases, weak sounds can't be heard. And so this is one major cause of hearing loss as measured by the audiogram. But also tuning on the basilar membrane becomes more broad than normal. And we call this a loss of frequency selectivity. And as a result, the, the ability to separate the different frequencies in complex sounds, such as speech or music, is impaired. And in particular, it becomes much harder to understand speech in the presence of background noise. And I'd like to play you a, a, a simulation of that. First of all, I'm going to play you a piece of speech uh, without any processing. So if you have normal hearing, you, sh you should be able to understand this speech. But initially it's presented in quiet and then it's presented in a background noise, which is faded in. And it should be difficult, but not impossible to understand the speech in the background noise. So let's hear that. A senior Spanish army officer has been shot and killed in a terrorist attack in Madrid. General Guillermo Quintana Lacapi, who is 67, is a former commander of the military region which includes the Spanish capital. No one is admitted carrying a... Okay, and now I'm going to play you a simulation of what it's like to have reduced frequency selectivity. And to do this processing, what we do is to process the sound in small frames. We calculate the spectrum in each frame, and then we smear that spectrum to imitate the effects of reduced frequency selectivity. And we do that for lots of overlapping frames and add the process signals back together again. So let's have, this is just simulating what it's like to have a loss of frequency selectivity without any sensitivity loss. A senior Spanish army officer has been shot and killed in a terrorist attack in Madrid. General Guillermo Quintana Bacardi, who was 67, is the former commander of the military region which includes the Spanish capital. No one has admitted to carrying out the effect. It is widely believed it is the work of a vast sector organization, etc. And uh, most people uh, find that it is much more difficult to understand the speech, especially in noise, um, when you apply this simulation of reduced frequency selectivity. OK, now another effect that results from reduced outer hair cell function is an effect called loudness recruitment. Uh, with this effect, weak sounds are not heard at all. They're simply inaudible, but intense sounds appear as loud to the impaired ear as they would to a normal ear. So the loudness of the sound catches up at high sound levels. Um, and another way of putting that is that a person with reduced outer hair cell function has a reduced dynamic range. They can only hear comfortably over a small range of sound levels.
Okay, I want to talk next a bit about the inner hair cells and their function. And as I said, the inner hair cells detect the vibrations on the basilar membrane and transform them into neural signals in the auditory nerve. And sometimes the inner hair cells don't function at all over a certain region of the cochlea. And that can be caused by exposure to intense impulse sounds like rifle sounds or explosions. And that a region where there is no inner hair cell function at all is called a dead region. And I think that that's a name that I, I was one of the first to use this name. And a dead region may also be associated with loss of synapses between inner hair cells and neurons and with degeneration of the neurons themselves. Uh, but in humans, neurons may survive even when inner hair cells and synapses are lost. And that's the reason why cochlear implants work, because cochlear implants electrically stimulate the remaining auditory neurons. So they, they depend on some neurons surviving, even when the inner hair cells themselves are not working. And here's an illustration of how we can define the extent of a dead region. Here's a schematic illustration of the cochlea, the apex tuned to low frequencies, the base tuned to high frequencies. And these numbers next to the, the coiled up structure are the frequencies that are that the, these places are tuned to. So this place is tuned to a very high frequency, 20,000 hertz. The apex is tuned to about 50 hertz. Uh, and in this illustration, I've assumed that the inner hair cells and neurons and synapses are functioning up it, up to about 2,500 hertz, the place in the cochlea tuned to 2,500 hertz, that's this green region, but the remaining parts of the cochlea are dead. And so we would define this as a dead region with an edge frequency of 2,500 hertz. So it, it, it starts uh, at the place tuned to 5,000 hertz and carries on from there. And here's an example of a, a, a real dead region. This is a a cochlea extracted from a 25-year-old man who had been in the military service, been exposed to intense impact sounds, especially rifle shots. Uh, and these dark lines here show the neurons that go to make up the auditory nerve. And you can see that at the base of the cochlea, the neurons are completely missing. So this is a dead region here. And there's another dead region here. And then some surviving neurons, but rather poor survival in these regions. But the apex, which responds to low frequencies and the mid frequency region has a normal complement of neurons. So we would describe this as a high frequency dead region at the base of the cochlea. Uh, and we've shown that tones whose frequencies fall in a, within a dead region can be heard if you make them intense enough but they're not detected in the dead region, they're detected at an adjacent region, uh, which is still functioning. And such tones often do not have a clear pitch. They may sound noise-like or distorted. Um, and for people with extensive continuous dead regions at high frequencies, speech intelligibility may be poor, even for speech in quiet. And I'd like to play you a, a demonstration of that. First, you'll hear simply some unprocessed speech in quiet, uh, and you should be able to understand this uh, pretty well. The North Wind and the Sun. The North Wind and the Sun were arguing one day about which of them was the stronger, when a traveller came along wrapped in a warm coat. OK, and now here, to simulate a dead region, all I've done is uh, I've low pass filtered the sound to remove the high frequencies. I've removed all frequencies above one kilohertz and that, that's a crude simulation of a dead region. And you can still hear that it's speech, um, but you, you'll find it's much harder to understand. They agreed that the one who could make the traveler take his coat off would be considered stronger than the other one. Then the north wind blew as hard as he could but the harder he blew, the tighter the traveller wrapped his coat around him. And I think you'll agree that that was very hard to understand. So that illustrates the problem faced by people with extensive continuous dead regions. 
Um, uh, and we found that for people who have these extensive dead regions, if you amplify frequencies well inside the dead region via a hearing aid, that does not improve speech perception, but it may lead to problems with distortion, either distortion produced by the hearing aid itself or some kind of distortion in the auditory system. And it can lead to uh, acoustic feedback where the sound generated by the hearing aid leaks back to the microphone and sets up a whistling sound. So we recommend that when a person has a dead region, you only apply amplification for frequencies up to about 1.7 times the edge frequency. Uh, and that seems to give better results than amplifying over the widest frequency range that you can. I want to talk now about partial loss of inner hair cells and neurons. So not a complete dead region, but nevertheless some damage to the inner hair cells and neurons. And it's been shown recently in animals that if you expose them to intense sounds, this can produce a loss of the synapses between the inner hair cells uh, and the neurons and subsequent degeneration of neurons, even when there is no hearing loss as measured by the audiogram. So these intense sounds are what producing what's called a temporary hearing loss as measured by the audiogram, but it's producing some permanent underlying damage that isn't showing up in the audiogram. And it's been shown also that in humans, aging is associated with loss of synapses and neurons, even in the absence of noise exposure, and that may lead to difficulties in the discrimination of sounds, even when the audiogram is normal. So the the traditional clinical measure of hearing, the audiogram, doesn't reveal all forms of hearing loss. There may be substantial loss of synapses and neurons with little or no change in the audiogram. Uh, and an illustration of that is, is uh, shown here. This is from a paper by Wu et al. Uh, and it's showing the number of auditory nerve fibers per inner hair cell as a function of age. And this is shown for uh, the apical region of the cochlea that's tuned mainly to low frequencies, 0.2 to 1 kilohertz. And for the medium to high frequency region of the cochlea, tuned to frequencies between 1.4 and 8 kilohertz. And you can see that for both regions, on average, there's a decline in the number of auditory nerve fibers with increasing age. And that occurs even for the part of the cochlea that responds to low frequencies where the audiometric threshold does not change much with age. And by the time you get to my age, uh, you've lost about 65% of the neurons in your auditory nerve, um, which accounts for why I, partly for why I often have trouble understanding speech, especially in noisy situations. Okay, so when you have this loss of synapses and neurons, you get more noisy transmission of information from the cochlea to the brain. And this leads to a general reduction in the ability to discriminate sounds, including speech. Uh, and in particular, it leads to problems in, in problems in extracting what I call the temporal fine structure of the waveform on the basilar membrane, the detailed time pattern of that waveform. And I don't have time to go into that in this talk, but if anyone is interested, I've written an entire book about it and you can have a look at that book. OK, um, but just to give you some of the conclusions, uh, reduced sensitivity to temporal fine structure, which is common in hearing impaired people, leads to poorer frequency discrimination of pure and complex sounds, so a poorer perception of pitch a poorer ability to segregate mixtures of sounds, particularly speech and noise, and a reduced ability to localize sound based on slight differences in the timing of the sound at the two ears, so poorer spatial hearing as well. Okay, so let's move on now to talk about hearing aids and what they can do. And 20 or 30 years ago, hearing aids basically acted as linear amplifiers with frequency response shaping. Uh, so uh, they applied uh, um, an amount of amplification that depended on the hearing loss. 
Hearing loss is usually greater at some frequencies than at other frequencies, and so hearing aids amplified where the hearing loss was greatest. Um, but the hearing, the amount of amplification was independent of the input sound level. So for example, you might apply 30 decibels of amplification at four kilohertz, but the amount of amplification would be independent of the incoming sound level. And that doesn't compensate for the effects of loudness recruitment and reduced dynamic range. Now I'd like to play you an example of that. Uh, first, I'm going to play you a piece of music that has a wide range of sound levels. It goes from a loud passage to a soft passage. So let's have a listen, listen to a part of that. Okay, and, and hopefully if, if you had normal hearing, you could still hear that soft passage, although it was even, it was very soft. Now I'm going to play you a, a simulation of what it's like to listen through a hearing aid that, that amplifies linearly, but to have loudness recruitment. Um, and what you'll find is that the, you can still hear the loud passage, it's maybe even slightly louder than before, but the soft passage is completely inaudible. Okay, and, and I hope you, during that uh, part in the music, you probably couldn't hear anything at all, and I, and I certainly couldn't. So to deal with that, uh, manufacturers introduced uh, something called multi-channel fast compression, and pretty much all hearing aids today are applied digital processing to the signals. They split the sound into several frequency bands, anything between two and 20, or sometimes even more. And then they apply amplitude compression in each band. So soft sounds are amplified a lot uh, and intense sounds are not amplified. And the amount of amplification changes rapidly with time. So that's why this is called fast acting compression. And in theory, this compensates for the effects of loudness recruitment. And I want to play you a simulation of a very simple two channel fast acting compression system. This is similar to one that, that I worked on in the early days uh, of compression in hearing aids. And the, uh, this uh, first study in 1983 uh, was one of the first published demonstrations of the benefits of multi-channel compression. Um, and this later paper describes one of the first successful commercial implementations of multi-channel compression. So let's have a listen to that and hopefully in this simulation you'll be able to hear the uh, softer passage of the music. Okay, so um, this is something that's been a, a great success and has been implemented in, in many commercial hearing aids. But there's some problems with this fast acting compression where the amplification changes rapidly over time. First, if you apply a lot of fast acting compression, it reduces the depth of amplitude modulation, the patterns of amplitude fluctuation in speech, and that actually leads to reduced speech intelligibility.
amplitude modulation patterns convey important information about speech. And secondly, fast compression makes the world sound noisier. People who use such hearing aids complain that they, they're more aware of background sounds uh, popping up each time uh, the, there's a pause in the ongoing speech that they want to listen to, they hear the background now is coming, noise coming up and that's annoying. And there's a, a third effect is that if you have, say, two people talking at once, they're two independent sounds, but when they're put through this fast acting compression, they get a form of cross modulation. The, the amplitude modulation in one sound affects the amount of compression and that introduces amplitude modulation into the other sound and that makes it harder to segregate the two sounds perceptually. Uh, so this cross modulation effect is also a, a bad thing that impairs speech intelligibility. So many manufacturers have uh, experimented with the use of a slow acting compression, where, which is also called automatic gain control. And these systems adjust the gain automatically for different listening situations, uh, whether you're in a very noisy place or in a soft place. Uh, and it's like having a volume control that you could adjust manually, but it's done fully automatically, which is important because older people can't adjust the volume control on the hearing aids very well. So as I said, these systems are, off, are they're sometimes called automatic volume control rather than automatic gain control. Uh, and this slow acting compression has the advantage that it doesn't adversely affect modulation patterns in speech. It maintains the modulation patterns. It doesn't make the world sound noisier. It, it can make all sounds at a comfortable listening level, but it doesn't restore loudness perception to normal. You have to get used to it because it's changing. But it's not the same as having normal loudness perception. But such systems have been implemented in several digital hearing aids um, and cochlear implants as well, and I won't have time to talk about those, but some of the slow AGC systems that we've developed have been incorporated in hearing aids and cochlear implants. Now, um, it's difficult to compensate for the effects of reduced frequency selectivity. I talked a bit about reduced frequency selectivity earlier on, and I played a demonstration illustrating that it contributes to difficulties in understanding speech in noise. And one way that you can attempt to enhance uh, or compensate for the effects of reduced frequency selectivity is to enhance the spectral contrast in sounds. So you magnify the differences between peaks and valleys in the short term spectrum. And that can lead to uh, small improvements in speech intelligibility and may improve listening comfort. And I'd like to play you a demonstration of that. In this demonstration, you'll hear uh, each sentences in noise and each sentence is played first without the processing and then with the processing. And this has been set up so the background noise level is not changed much by the processing, but the speech is enhanced and it appears to pop out a bit more from the background noise. So hopefully in each pair of sentences, the second one will sound a bit clearer than the first because the second one has the processing. Pepper pot was empty. Pepper pot was empty. The dog drank from a bowl. The dog drank from a bowl. A girl came into the room. A girl came into the room. They're pushing an old car. They're pushing an old car. Okay, so that that processing can work quite well. Um, but there's a practical problem with it um, that you need to process the signal with fairly fine frequency resolution, and that introduced a time delay, and the time delay turned out to be too long. Uh, to use in wearable hearing aids. And so this form of signal processing hasn't been implemented in, in hearing aids, um, but there's a lot of work going on, on the at the moment to try to use uh, machine learning uh, or artificial intelligence to enhance signals in a similar way with a shorter 
processing delay, and that's that's an ongoing research activity. Um, now, there are no methods of compensating directly for reduced frequency selectivity or poor sensitivity to temporal fine structure, but anything that can be done to improve the signal to noise ratio may help. And one thing that does seem to work is directional microphones. Most hearing aids have two microphones built into them. Uh, some have three microphones built into them. And some manufacturers allow hearing aids to communicate across ears. So if, you're, uh, if you have a microphone on each side, uh, a hearing aid on each side, you may have four microphones altogether, or even six in some cases. And these can be used to selectively pick up sounds from a particular direction, usually the front, and to suppress sounds from other directions. And this processing can be adaptive. Uh, in many hearing aids, the processing searches for the most prominent interfering sounds and, and it produces a, a null in the directional response for the direction of those sounds to reduce them as far as possible. Um, so these, this has been implemented in most hearing aids and it does work and it does improve the ability to understand speech in noise, but it doesn't work well in rooms with a high level of reverberation, for example, in a church. Uh, and it doesn't work well when the sound the listener wishes to hear doesn't come from the front. Mostly these systems are set up to enhance sounds coming from the front and suppress sounds from other directions. Some more advanced systems try to select the most prominent interfering sound, sorry, the most prominent talker, uh, who hopefully is the one you listen to, but that's not always the one you want to listen to. And some hearing aids allow the user to select what sounds they, they want to listen to using a remote control so they can select listen to the right or listen to the left or listen to in front. Uh, and that can, can work better, but it still has some, some practical issues. Um, uh, and uh, that this is summarizing what I just said, that you can select the uh, to uh, hear a, a sound in a particular direction with a remote control. Some problems with this kind of processing is that they tend to throw away the normal binaural cues that we use to localize sounds. Um, we rely on small differences in the signals at the two ears to localize sounds, and those differences are thrown away in these uh, beam forming approaches to create high directionality. And they're not so useful when the direction of the speech you want to listen to changes rapidly, like when there are two people talking who are alternating between uh, the, the one who's the, the main talker. And of course, there are problems when the attended sound is not the most prominent one. I want to just, in the last few minutes, briefly talk about some problems with digital hearing aids. The processing involves time delays, and these time delays may disrupt sound perception, spatial sound perception, when a single hearing aid is used. Um, typically, the, the delay produced by hearing aids is between one and eight milliseconds, but the delay produced by uh, a difference in, in a sound that's off to one side, the difference at the two ears is less than one millisecond. So the delays introduced by the hearing aids are large compared to the delays uh, for natural sound, and that can disrupt spatial sound processing. And some many digital hearing aids introduce artifacts to the sound, some something that's not quite right about the sound, processing artifacts, produced by schemes for noise reduction or spectral enhancement, reducing this whistling sound, the feedback that I talked about, this adaptive directional processing that I talked about, and fast acting compression. All of these can introduce sound artifacts that reduce sound quality. Uh, some general limitations with current hearing aids are that if you block the ear canal, this makes the person's own voice sound too loud or boomy, and this is called the occlusion effect. Uh, it happens because the low frequency sounds generated by a person's own voice are trapped. They normally escape from the ear canal, but they're trapped when you block the ear canal and make the user's own voice sound boomy. And that can be alleviated by using what's called an open fitting, 
where the ear canal isn't blocked, there's an opening into the ear canal, but those are only suitable for people with relatively mild hearing losses. But here's an example of an open fitting. It's a behind the ear device, but the part that goes into the ear has these openings and they let sound leak through naturally. And they're often used for people with good low frequency hearing, but some hearing loss at high frequencies. But a problem with open fill fittings is that you get an effect called comb filtering. The sound that's reaching the mixture of the sound that leaks past the open fitting and the sound that's produced amplified via the hearing aid. And this leads to a ripple in the frequency response uh, and it, that reduces sound quality. And this sound that leaks past the open dome also reduces the benefits of directional microphones because the sound leaking past the, uh, the dome is, is not a subject to directional processing. Now, many hearing aids have a rather limited frequency range. And here's an example. This is a study that I did many years ago with Jin Chuan Tan, where we got people to rate the sound quality of speech and music uh, that were filtered to remove either the low frequencies, uh, and here's the lower cutoff frequencies, or the high frequencies, uh, and here's the upper cutoff frequency. And we had lots of combinations of cutoff frequency for the low cutoff and the high cutoff. And you get the best rated quality for the widest bandwidth when you have a, a low, low frequency cutoff and a high, high frequency cutoff. And here is what you get for typical hearing aid. Most hearing aids apply amplification from about 200 Hertz up to about four and a half thousand hertz and so you can see that the sound quality is pretty lousy um, so how can you extend the frequency response of hearing aids well i describe here one uh, fairly new solution uh, produced by a company called ear lens and this is a, a hearing aid that i actually use myself so it involves a behind the ear part uh, a part that fits in the ear canal and then a device that's actually mounted on the eardrum. So this, this uh, flexible platform here sits around the edge of the ear drum, and the eardrum is vibrated directly via transducer that sits uh, just above the eardrum. So um, the earpiece contains a coil that transmits a signal to a receiver coil uh, that's on the ear-mounted part and that uh, activates a motor, so both signal and power are received here, that activates a vibrator that vibrates the eardrum directly. And this, um, so uh, this is the way it works, um, and leading to vibration of the eardrum via this uh, signal, this radiated electromagnetic signal. Um, and this capable is achieve, capable of achieving uh, amplification over a very wide frequency range. Uh, and this just illustrates the average insertion gains that were preferred for soft sounds by people in, in the study that I described here. These were mostly people who had greater hearing loss at high frequencies than at low frequencies. And correspondingly, the gain that the amplification increases at high frequencies. And you can see that this system is producing amplification up to uh, about 11 kilohertz, uh, and it can produce up to 55 or 60 dB of gain at high frequencies, which is enough to suit the great majority of people. Uh, and this just shows uh, sound preferences for this uh, for unaided listening uh, uh, or conventional hearing aids. This is their, their ratings of the ear lens system relative to either unaided listening or their own hearing aids. And you can see mostly they prefer their, the ear lens system to their own hearing aids. Um, uh, and they, they, might, they greatly prefer the ear lens system to not using a hearing aid at all. So just to, <clears throat> to give you some conclusions, Hearing loss is a major health burden. Um, hearing loss involves much more than just a loss of sensitivity to soft sounds. It involves a loss of frequency selectivity. It involves loudness recruitment 
and it involves synaptopathy. Hearing aids can help that via frequency selective compression amplification, they can restore audibility of soft sounds and compensate for the effects of loudness recruitment. And they can help to some extent with reduced frequency selectivity and synaptopathy via the use of directional microphones, um, but they're still far from perfect in compensating for loss of frequency selectivity and synaptopathy. So there are still many, many limitations, there's still room for improvement. And I'll thank you for listening. And that's the end of my presentation. So I'll stop there and invite your questions and comments. Yeah.